what this does is, according to the chief actuary of Medicare, he's saying as much as 20% of Medicare's providers will either go out of business or will have to stop seeing Medicare beneficiaries. Millions of seniors who are on who have chosen Medicare Advantage will lose the coverage that they now enjoy. You can't say that you're using this money to either extend Medicare solvency and also offset the cost of this new program. That's double counting. And so when you take a look at all of this, when you strip out the double counting and what I would call these gimmicks, the full 10-year cost of this bill has a $460 billion deficit. The second 10-year cost of this bill has a $1.4 trillion deficit. And I think probably the most cynical gimmick in this bill is something that we all probably agree on. We don't think we should cut doctors 21% next year. We've stopped those cuts from occurring every year for the last seven years. We all call this here in Washington the doc fix. Well, the doc fix, according to your numbers, cost $371 billion. It was in the first iteration of all these bills. But because it was a big price tag and it made the score look bad, made it look like a deficit, that, bill was, that provision was taken out and it's been going on as standalone legislation. But ignoring these costs does not remove them from the backs of taxpayers. Hiding spending does not reduce spending. And so when you take a look at all of this, it just doesn't add up. And so let's just, I'll finish with the cost curve. Are we bending the cost curve down or are we bending the cost curve up? Well, if you look at your own chief actuary at Medicare, we're bending it up. He's claiming that we're going up $222 billion, adding more to the unsustainable fiscal situation we have. And so when you take a look at this, it's really deeper than the deficits or the budget gimmicks or the actuarial analysis. There really is a difference between us. And, and we've been talking about how much we agree on different issues, but there really is a difference between us. And it's basically this. We don't think the government should be in control of all of this. We want people to be in control. And that, at the end of the day, is the big difference. Now, we've offered lots of ideas all last year, all this year, because we agree that status quo is unsustainable. It's got to get fixed. It's bankrupting families. It's bankrupting our government. It's hurting families with pre-existing conditions. We all want to fix this, but we don't think that this is the answer to the solution and all of the analysis we get proves that point. Now, I'll just simply say this, and, and I respectfully disagree with the, with the Vice President about what the American people are or are not saying or whether we're qualified to speak on their behalf. So, uh, we are all representatives of the American people. We all do town hall meetings. We all talk to our constituents. And I've got to tell you, the American people are engaged. And if you think they want a government takeover of health care, I would respectfully submit you're not listening to them. So what we simply want to do is start over, work on a clean shaded paper, move through these issues step by step, and fix them and bring down health care costs and not raise them. And that's basically the point. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, Javier Becerra, but I, I just want to follow up on a couple points. I, 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 there, there are some strong disagreements on the numbers here, Paul, and, you know, but I don't want to get too bogged down. And, um, I, the first question I have is uh, whether your side thinks Medicare Advantage is working well. Uh, because I think it's important just to point out that when we keep on talking about cuts in Medicare, what we're really talking about is what Joe alluded to, which is a decision was made a while back to set up a system in which Medicare costs, let's say, a dollar, under the government program that 80 percent of people still use and are perfectly satisfied with and there's no showing that uh, it's not working for them. We said we'd give it to private insurers and we'd give them a, a bonus of a dollar fifteen for every dollar in the normal plan. And it turns out that people aren't healthier because of that extra fifteen dollars or fifteen cents it's estimated that it's costing us about a hundred and eighty billion dollars over ten years let's say eighteen billion dollars a year and essentially what my proposal would do and what the house and senate proposals would do would say instead of having the insurance companies get that money let's take that money the savings are, are between four hundred and fifty uh... four hundred and five hundred billion dollars a year and let's devote some of that money to closing the donut hole, which has already been talked about. Seniors who 
need more prescription drugs than uh, than Medicare currently is willing to pay for hit this gap where suddenly they've got to use it out of pocket and they just stop taking the drugs or they break them in half or what have you. Let's fill that. That costs around $30 billion a year or $300 billion. Uh, and you know, let's make some other changes that would result in actually uh, the 80% of seniors who aren't in Medicare Advantage getting a better deal. So uh, the, you know, we, we can address some of the, the, the broader issues, but I, I, I just want to focus on Medicare Advantage because I haven't seen an independent analyst look at this and say seniors are healthier for it or taxpayers are better off for it. That's what we're talking about reforming. We're not talking about cutting benefits uh, under the Medicare program as is required under law. What we're talking about is Medicare Advantage. And you know, it may be that some people here think that it's working. I know that there are some Republicans who are sitting at this table who don't think it's working. You can argue and say, okay, let's not do Medicare Advantage and let's not close the donut hole, for example. Uh, or you know, there may be other ways you want to spend that money. But I just want to establish whether we've got some agreement that the Medicare Advantage program, which is what we are proposing to reform, is actually not a good deal for taxpayers or for seniors, and certainly not a good deal for the 80 percent of seniors who aren't in Medicare Advantage, because by the way, they're paying an extra premium of about 90 bucks a year to subsidize the 20 percent who are in Medicare Advantage. Mr. President, Mr. President, President John McCain also would like to address that issue. Uh, I'm sorry, so if yeah. somebody else wants to address it, if it, you know, I was... I, 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 I just make one comment. Why in the world then would we carve out 800,000 people in Florida that would not be have their Medicare Advantage cut? Now, I propose an amendment on the floor to say everybody will be treated the same. Now, Mr. President, why should we carve out 800,000 people because they live in Florida to keep the Medicare Advantage program and then want to do away with it? I think you make a legitimate point. Well, maybe... I, I think thank you, you do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, l let me, let me just jump in for a minute. I'm happy to respond. I'm ready. Uh, I'm going to have your, in fairness, I, I, I asked a question, so I'm going to let one of the Republicans uh, respond and then I'll go to Javier. Okay, go ahead. You know, the assumption, I think it's important for the American public to hear, we have Medicare Part D, except no senior in this country ever paid a tax dollar for it. And we're talking about filling a donut hole on a program that they're already benefiting from. It's, we're going to leave $11 trillion in debt for our children. I'm not sure the seniors want us to leave more debt for their children to fill a donut hole. And when we talk about filling the donut hole by taking away from people who can't afford to buy a supplemental policy, that's where Medicare Part A helps poor people in Oklahoma, is they get to buy Medicare Part C. We never call it Part C, but that's what it is. And they don't have to buy a supplemental policy. So consequently, they get lots of the benefits that other people who have better buying power in Medicare with a supplemental policy. So it's a trade-off of whether or not we say, where are we going to give the benefits? What we really should be doing is saying, we're broke. Medicare's broke. We're working, struggling together to try to get there. Let's not add new benefits anywhere. And let's make sure the benefits that we have today get applied more equitably. Well, I, I, I think that's... A it's a legitimate point. I would just point out that 80% of seniors are helping to pay in extra premiums for the 20% who are in this uh, Medicare Advantage. And it's not means tested, so it's not as if the people who are in Medicare Advantage are somehow the poor people who can't afford supplementals. It's pretty random. And what we also know is, and I just want to point this out, Tom. 180 billion of it's going to insurance companies. It's not going to seniors. It's going to insurance companies, including big insurance company profits, so without any appreciable improvement in health care benefits. That's not a good way for us to spend money. I, I, I agree with you about uh, the fact that the prescription drug plan added to our deficits because we didn't pay for it. And I, I just had to point out that didn't happen under my watch. It happened under the previous Congress. There's some people. Yeah, John was uh, is an example of somebody who was true to his convictions and didn't vote for it. 
I didn't move on. Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, you know that was costly, and we do have to deal with that. On the other hand, that the, the problem I don't think is is that we gave seniors prescription drug benefits. I think the problem is is that we didn't pay for it.